Let's stand and invite the Lord before we go into his word. Lord Jesus, we know you're already here. We just pray that you would prepare our hearts as we open up your word. God, I pray that we would be faithful to it, that we would understand what you have to speak to us, God. Prepare us, Lord, remove the distractions, God, all the different thoughts, Lord, that are nagging, recurring, Lord, and I pray that we would set our eyes onto you, God, and that you would be the one who would speak into all of our hearts today. We pray this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. As a question for you as you're sitting down, what is the most commonly mentioned uh, city in the Bible? Any guesses? Did someone say that? You can say it louder. What, what city? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. No, nope, nope, nope. Another one. Jerusalem. Yes, 811 times. Now, can anyone guess what the second most commonly named city in the Bible is? And it's not Bethlehem. Corinth. Not Corinth. Any, any other guessers? Babylon, yes, you got it right. You deserve some kind of pride, and I'm sorry, prize, and I'm sorry for scaring you. It's 286 times. The next city is, you know, a lot less than that, Jericho. So you could say that in a, from a certain lens, the Bible is a story, God's story, of a tale of two cities, right? God's kingdom, Jerusalem, and Satan's kingdom, Babylon, right? The new Jerusalem, and it, the Bible talks about Jerusalem as the presence of God, the place where we will be with God forever, right? Heaven is the new Jerusalem. We will dwell there with him. Whereas Babylon is always an image of evil, false idol worship, lust, greed, and pride. And continuing down this train of Babylon, interestingly enough, you, we all remember the story in Genesis 11 about the Tower of Babel, right? Remember after the flood, people try to build that tower to the heavens thinking they can reach God. Well, interestingly enough, the Tower of Babel and Babylon in Hebrew are spelled the exact same way. In Russian, it's also the same way. Bashnia Vavilonska, right? It's the Tower of Babylon. And interestingly enough, in the Bible, both the Genesis Tower of Babel and the city of Babylon, both of them are described as being in the plains of Shinar. So we can deduce that they are likely the same exact place, the tower and then that ultimate great city that took Israel into captivity, right? And what's interesting is that first city of Babel, the Tower of Babel, was built by Nimrod, who was a great grandson of Noah. And his name literally means we have rebelled, right? He was an evil and wicked king who sought to rebel against God. And we read in Genesis 11, when they tried to build that tower, they said, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its tops in the heaven, and interestingly, the word Babel literally means bab L. L means God, Bab means gate. So the gate of God or the gate to God, or you could think of like the gate to the heavens, right? In their pride, they thought that they can build their way up to God. They can reach God on their own. And they did all of this, and it says it right there in Genesis 11. They said, let us make a name for ourselves, right? That was the root of all of that. Now, Going back, what was the very first sin that we know of in the universe? And a hint, it wasn't in the garden. What was the very first sin? Pride, right? Pride, Satan had pride in his heart. Satan thought he can exalt himself over God, didn't he? And ever since his fall, his kingdom has been trying to make a name for itself, right? Even in the garden, what did Satan promise Eve? You're going to be like God. Pride, right? King of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, as he stood over his city, he, he said on the roof, he said, look at what a great city I built for myself. What's the root of that? Pride. From the very beginning, pride has been standing in direct opposition to God, and it hasn't stopped. 
We as people, we've been trying to exalt ourselves. If we're honest, we've been trying to exalt ourselves from the very beginning up until this very moment. And it doesn't matter with what, right? All of humanity has been trying to make a name for itself. Almost all the different, like if you look at the different accomplishments and inventions and discoveries and companies and empires, all of it at the root was done out of a pers- people's desire to exalt themselves out of pride. All the human greatness in this world, when it tries to exalt itself over God, is a challenge to God That's why James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You see, pride is that ancient root of rebellion that has eaten its way into every one of our hearts. And it manifests itself through a billion different ways every single day, because there's a billion of us, right? So much conflict, whether it be at home or at work or between relationships comes out of pride, right? Oh, they, you can't treat me like that. You ought to treat me better than that. Pride. Wars, they get started because some king wants a larger kingdom. He wants to be remembered as a great leader. But it's not just the big things, right? Wars and kingdoms that are built on pride. Pride influences everything about people, doesn't it? What they wear, how they talk, what they eat, where they live, what they drive, and what they do. I remember just as a silly example, uh, remember shortly after I repented, I was in 12th grade, and believe it or not, but I had long hair, like probably this long, right? And in, uh, this is silly and embarrassing, but I thought it was so beautiful. I thought it, I looked so good, right? And, and I remember every time I'd walk by the mirror, I'd look at myself. I know this is embarrassing, but I'd look at myself and I'd just think about how good I looked, right? Just the conceit and the pride at that. And I remember one time I was sitting on my couch, I still remember this, and I was reading a book by C.J. Mahaney, and it was, the book was called Humility. Very small, short book. And I'm reading... And God just starts convicting me about that. It's like, hey, Peter, this is your pride right here. You know, your hair is your pride. And I'm saying, you know, I just kind of, you push the thought away, right? You know, hoping it never comes back. And he's reading, reading, reading 20 minutes later. Just again, like, hey, Peter, this is wrong. You know, you know, just push it away. Just, I'm reading a book about humility, okay? Don't distract me. So, and 20 minutes later, at one point, I just had to, Close the book. I'm like, God, I have to deal with this. And I began to wrestle. I'm like, God, is it really that big of a deal? Like, is it really that big of a deal? Come on, it's just, you know, just hair, it's just this. And I, after praying and wrestling, I don't know, I don't remember how long it took, but at one point I just, I surrendered. I said, God, you're right. You're right. I called my cousin. I said, hey, Alex, can you swing by and do me a favor? He comes over. I'm like, cut it off, just fully, just do a one, a zero, you know, just all the way. He's like, you sure, man? It's not going to look good. He's like, I, I'm sure. This, that's my purpose, you know? So he takes it off, and just a sense of relief, you know? That it, it, and it, I know it's silly, but it felt so real, doesn't it? Like that thing that we hold on to that we think gives us some kind of worth, but the relief after that, and uh, I'm thankful that God gave me victory over that, but it, it was funny. The next day, we had a car wash with our community group over there where Safeway used to be. And, you know, I come, everyone says hi. Everyone's polite enough not to say anything, except for Matt Supran, my friend, who he comes and he's like, oh, Peter, I didn't recognize you at first. I thought you just came out of prison, you know? I'm like, thank you, brother, thank you. That cleaned out what remained of pride about my hair, you know? That just, that got rid of it right there. Um, we all have that, don't we? Whatever it is, it doesn't have to be long hair. It can be anything, but it sits there, that ancient root. But we need to remember that this whole world, it exists for God, doesn't it? The purpose of the universe is to display to show the glory of God. This universe is like a stage. It's a theater, so to speak, where God's glory is being displayed for all observers. And throughout the ages, there has been this cosmic rebellion against God. 
of spirits and people at odds with their maker, hoping to steal some glory from people. And from the beginning, Satan and man, they've been trying, we have been trying to dethrone God. But on this stage, God is triumphing in Christ. And we're going to see that. And so the central theme of today's message is God's glory over human greatness. God's glory. And we're going to see what this triumph actually looks like. It looks like specifically how God has chosen to save people and whom he has chosen to save. So please open up your Bibles. We're not going to display the text right now on the screen. Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 1.17. I'm going to give you 20 seconds. 1 Corinthians 117. We're continuing where Brother Pete left off. 1 Corinthians 117, Paul says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly or foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And five verses of the next chapter. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I know that's a big chunk, but contextually, just so you understand, historically what likely was happening was people were going into the church of Corinth and they were giving nice speeches with eloquent wisdom, as it says. And, and the Greeks, they loved this, right? They, they had a whole study of this, right, of rhetoric, of how to give a persuasive speech, how to give a moving speech. And then, you know, there's all these different ways you can persuade people with logic and emotion and authority, right? And, and they were all about that. And that was seeping into the church. And Paul is pushing against that. He's saying, no, that's not how we do things here. That's not how God saves people but it's through Christ and him crucified. And it seems foolish to people, but that's the actual power of God. So with that being said, the main idea is God's glory over human greatness. And the first way, as we see on the screen, God's glory in how he saves. Let's go to the next slide. Let's look together at verse 18. Paul says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. The question is, 
why is the gospel, the word of the cross, why is it power towards God, but why is it foolish to those who are perishing? Or more importantly, why did God choose such a message that seems foolish to people? Why has God chosen a path of salvation that seems foolish? And the answer is found in the very next verse, verse 19. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discerning Discernment of the discerning I will thwart. In other words, God did it. God chose a path of foolishness in order to put to shame the pride of men, to humble those who exalt themselves. And Paul states this purpose again explicitly, if you read in verse 29, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. As we've already mentioned, God's glory is central in all things. Church, I want us to remember that. I want us to lay hold of this truth, this precious truth. Isaiah 42, 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other. Revelation 4, 11, worthy are you, our, God, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Romans eleven thirty six. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Amen, church. All glory belongs to him. And we need to remember its centrality in all things. He made all things. He upholds all things. And all of them exist for him. And because of that, all glory belongs to him. And it's important to remember Because what this means is that the main purpose of the gospel is not to save people. I know that might sound wrong at first, but but hear me out. The main purpose of the gospel is not to save sinners. If we say that that is the main purpose of the gospel, then what we have is a man-centered gospel, don't we? But, but the gospel is ultimately God-centered. God loves people. Yes, he absolutely loves people. Don't hear me wrong. He desires to save people. Yes and yes forever and amen. His love is unbounded. But the main, 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 main purpose of the gospel, along with all other things, is the glory of God, isn't it? The gl- God is at the center of all things, not us. Romans 11, from and through and to him are all things, including the way he saves people. Even the gospel, God's, God's saving people is ultimately for his glory And we want it to be that way, church. We want it to be that way because he gets the glory. He's the rightful owner. And we get the joy of experiencing his glory. There is no real competition, right? We want him to be at the center. We want his glory to be the purpose of all things because then we just get the joy of experiencing his infinite glory for all of eternity. But this is important to remember that the gospel is ultimately about God's glory because it's the key to understanding this passage. God isn't interested in just saving us by any means possible. Does that make sense? Like, he's not interested in just like, oh, like, what, how can I possibly save him? Oh, here's the first option. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump all over that and I'm going to save him this way. That's not his purpose. God's purpose is to save us in the most glory of God glorifying way possible. He doesn't want to just steal us from Satan, you know, as if as if it's this little guy that sneaks into a dragon's lair while the dragon is sleeping, comes into his bride, cuts her ropes and, and sneaks her out, right? That's not God's intention at all. The gospel is about God getting glory over all his enemies over Satan, over evil, over sin, over pride. God is interested in kicking down the door, waking up the dragon, giving him a proper whooping, all 
while saving his bride. God is, God is gonna do it in the most glorious way possible. The gospel is not just God saving his people, but the gospel is also God defeating his enemies in a way that best demonstrates his excellencies and his greatness. I'm gonna say that one more time. Please try to let this sink into your soul. The gospel isn't just about God saving us, but it's about God defeating his enemies in the most glorious way possible that best demonstrates his excellencies and his greatness. That's why Colossians 2.15 says that God disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Christ. So going back to Corinthians 1, how does a foolish gospel, foolish saving message, how does that bring glory to God? You might think like, how does that make sense, Paul? Verse 21, let's read it together. For since, yeah, thank you, verse 20, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. In God's infinite wisdom, God has determined that the world could not know God, reach God, come to love God through human intelligence, through human thinking and wisdom. That is by design. That's what the word of God is saying here in verse 21. Just like the people building the Tower of Babel could not actually reach heaven, They could not actually build a gate to God, access to God. So all the wise people throughout all the centuries and thousands of years have never, they have failed to reach God through their wisdom because that is God's plan, God's design of putting to shame human pride, human wisdom. Because if God, think about it this way, if God was reachable through philosophy, through human thinking and wisdom and maybe a new AI that will help us understand the ultimate meaning of life and reality, right? If that was reachable, then God would have been conquerable, right? He would have been overcome, comprehended. Comprehend means literally to grasp together. He would have been grasped by our own intelligence. But God, in his design, has made it so that we, with our ladders of philosophy and wisdom, could never actually reach the heavens. Verse 21, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. That's the second half of verse 21. The gospel seems foolish And it pleases God to use something that seems foolish. It's not actually foolish. Seems foolish to be the only effective way of actually giving people what they ultimately want. What do people ultimately want? We just want to live forever, right? We don't want to die. And we want to be happy, right? That's all that we want at the very core. Just to live forever and to be happy all my days. And it's God gets glory by giving us a foolish way of giving us that which we most desperately crave. Verse 22, for the Jews demand signs and the Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. What is is Paul talking about here? The Jews demand sign, meaning they wanted to see a demonstration of power. Like they want to see fire come from heaven and destroy the enemies of God. They want to sit on the throne and begin to lead and to rule, right? That's what the Jews want. They just want power, like an atomic bomb. That would have really pleased them. Like that would make everyone tremble and they would get to rule the world. The Greeks, on the other hand, they seek wisdom, meaning they want something that's going to give them that edge, right, to outsmart the next guy, right? They want to play 4D chess. They want to get ahead of everyone else, that knowledge, that insight, that wisdom. But God shows neither power nor wisdom of this world, but he chose a man who was executed in a shameful way on the cross, And that became our path of salvation. A modern-day equivalent, like if you want to understand the Jew at that time, 
for them, what that was like was, imagine, you know, it's the election, and we're voting in for, and we really need a strong leader in our country right now, and we vote in the the worst, the most immature, the, the most incompetent, incapable leader ever, right? And we're like, yay, this is our supreme leader who's going to lead us to victory and to glory. Now, for them, that, that's what it was like, right? They would have been embarrassed to say, our Messiah, our supreme leader, our king who's going to rule the world for us, he was uh, homeless and he was executed by the Romans. No, they were, they were ashamed of that. And same thing with the Jews, I mean, with the Greeks, right? They would just laugh at the idea of you telling them, hey, do you know what the secret to life and the universe is? Do you know what the secret of how to reach ultimate reality and understand the entire purpose of the world? What is it? It's this guy named Jesus. He was homeless, and he got crucified by the Romans. They would just laugh at you. They're like, no, that's, it, that can't be it, right? It's got to be some... It, It's got to be some secret philosophy, something very deep. But it can't be a man who was crucified, was killed by the Romans. Surely that cannot be it. Verse 24, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. To us who are being saved, we understand that Jesus is the power of God to save. We understand that he is the secret to everything ultimate reality. He is the secret to understanding the meaning of all of life. He is the secret that gives us access to God himself, Jesus Christ, the man. Verse 25, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So the foolishness of God, God can't be foolish, but the, what seems to be foolish proves to surpass all of man's wisdom. What seems to be God's weakness proves to surpass all the strength of men. And again, the reason he uses what seems to be foolish and weak is in order to demonstrate how great he is. God is not depending on human tactics. Church, when Jesus was leaving As he was giving the Great Commission, he didn't say, hey, make sure you guys stay up to date on the latest, you know, psychology and all the tricks and techniques that are being taught so that you can skillfully, well persuade people and really prove to them that I'm real or else they're not going to believe in me, right? Just make sure you, you stay up to date on that wisdom, right? Or make sure you get a lot of political power and then use that influence to get people to listen to me and get saved. That's not, that's not how Jesus does things. You know those old cheesy movies, for example, Chuck Norris, where you know, he's fighting everybody off, right? He's dodging bullets, you know, he's grabbing a knife, breaking it, whatever, right? And there's hundreds of people coming at him and he's just, he is conquering them all, right? And they're cheesy for us because we understand it's so unrealistic, right? But that's exactly what God is doing here through the gospel. He is using something small, weak, and foolish to shame the big, the strong, the wise, the powerful. And he's been doing that. He's got a pattern of doing that all throughout the Bible, right? If we look at Samson, think about that. Samson, probably the strongest human being that has ever lived. He had long hair, Long hair isn't exam- exactly an image of strength, right? Long hair is, has, it carries a, a characteristic of, f- you know, female qualities, of beauty, not strength. In fact, long hair in battle is a liability, right? Someone can use it against you as you're fighting in battle. That's why, you know, when you go to the army, they just buzz cut you right, right, right away, right? And yet God uses a man who carries... Th- long hair, and he uses him to, at one point, uses a jawbone to kill a thousand armed men. A jawbone isn't even a piece of metal, not even sharpened, it's just a bone. And yet he kills a thousand men. Or God uses David, who was a shepherd boy. Just think, average blue-collar boy to kill Goliath, who was probably twice as tall as him, right? Right? or 50% taller than him, who was a trained 
professional warrior from childhood. Like that's all that he knew. He was a killing machine. And God uses David to kill Goliath. What God says, what God says is, when I'm gonna go into this fight with the dragon, I'm not gonna take your tank that you're offering to me. I'm gonna come in with a butter knife. With a butter knife. And I'm gonna use that to conquer all of you. So that when I defeat my enemies, no one will be able to say, well, it's because we helped you out, God. It's because we gave you all these tools. (laughs) No, God doesn't want any of those tools. God gets the glory, not just in the fact that he saves, but in how he saves. So if this passage was a mystery to you before, I hope it's not anymore. It's God's way of getting glory over human greatness, over human pride. But he doesn't just get glory in how he saves, but he gets glory in whom he saves. So that's the second point. He gets glory through whom he saves. Verse 26 says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. And so God continues this trend, right? Not only does he use what seems to be foolish and weak methods, but God also saves those who are not impressive in the eyes of the world, right? If God came into this world and the only people that he chose were the elite, right? The powerful, the wise, the strong, right? The influential, everyone who won a Nobel Prize, all you guys get saved as well. If that's the approach that God took, the glory would not be to God, but it would be to those people who somehow have earned it. There was something in them that qualified them being saved by God. So instead, what God does is he goes in and he just, he just indiscriminately, you could say, saves all kinds of people. And he'll save some rich people and some smart people, but mostly just us, average people. Verse 27, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are. And he does it all for his glory. Verse 29, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Nobody will be able to stand in the presence of God one day and say, God, I know you saved me because I was smart, because I was strong, because I was good. No, church, we are all going to stand before the presence of God, fully just empty-handed, literally nothing in our hands, just naked, right? Just fully empty-handed and say, God, thank you. God, thank you. There was no reason in me for you to save me and yet you saved me. Lord, thank you. No one will steal glory from God. And God has planned this out long, long ago. And isn't it beautiful, church, that God's grace doesn't depend on something in us. We can rest in that. We can breathe knowing that it doesn't depend on us. God doesn't save us on how rich, how smart, how strong, how good, how wise we are, but just because of his grace, for his glory. We can rest in the fact that God saves us because of our weaknesses, not in spite of them. You know, it's like those commercials. Do you have bad credit? Well, you're pre-approved. That's exactly what the gospel is. We have that bad credit. And in fact, if you, have, if you think you have good credit, God's not interested. Get out of here. Because he came to save the sick, the lost, right? Only God is getting credit here through salvation. Mark, 20, Mark 2, verse 17, Jesus says, Those who are healthy do not need a physician, but the sick do. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And verse 30, And because of him, 
you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And you know what's amazing? We come to Christ foolish. We come to him average, weak, filthy. But we read that he becomes for us wisdom. It's not just that God gives us wisdom with Christ. No, Christ is our wisdom, church. He himself is our wisdom. He is our righteousness. He is our sanctification, our purification, our redemption. It's not that when we come to Christ, God gives us a sign-up bonus with Jesus. No, Jesus is the sign-up bonus himself. He is all of God's goodness for us. Just like that song says, Christ is my reward. Amen? He is enough, church. Christ is enough. If you are in Christ, you have enough. You have it all. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. And that's why it says, verse 31, therefore, right? Let the one who boasts, don't boast in yourself and your qualities and how great you are but boast in the Lord. That's the only room we have for boasting in what the Lord has done for us. In the last five verses, as we quickly run through them, and I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. What Paul is saying is, I did not resort to human tactics and tricks and wisdom and best practices, but by an open declaration of the truth of the gospel. In fact, Paul says that he wasn't impressive when he came. I'm sure we would not be impressed. He says, in weakness, fear, trembling. It's hard to imagine, but that's who he was like. But his words were of power, were of power of the Spirit, right? People got saved. People's lives were radically changed. Sinners came to know Jesus. Paul didn't do ministry that way, and I don't think we should either. Why? Verse 5, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That our faith, our salvation, it wouldn't depend on the latest research that psychologists are doing the latest, awesome, smartest piece of advice, studies, that our faith, which gives us that daily sustenance, that it would be, that it would not give glory to men and that it would not depend on something so changeable, right? Human opinion, human wisdom, it's always changing, but God's power never changes. We need to have faith. Our faith needs to rest in the power of God and be upheld by it. Amen? And so lastly, as we close, what does this mean for us? What does this mean for us? First takeaway is we need to be humble, church. We need to be humble. If you think that there is something in you that separates you from the rest, that makes you better in some way than your neighbor, than the person next to you, in front of you, or behind you, you're telling yourself a lie. You are deceiving your own self you will never be able to get that glory. All glory belongs to God because whatever it is that we think we are better in, that we think we have that makes us better than others, none of those things can solve our greatest problem, which is the problem of sin, right? It's worthless when it comes to solving the only real problem that we need to solve. We are going to face the wrath of God unless we get saved by the grace of God. 
Amen? And, and there is nothing we can do. There's nothing in us. No wealth, no status, no relationships, no success, no uniqueness, skills, strength, power, wisdom, nothing will be able to save us on that last day except the grace of God which is outside of us. So then why are we boasting in those things which cannot save? Our only boast is Jesus Christ. And what he has done for us, he is our wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. The next takeaway is to those who maybe you feel beat down. If you feel like lonely, you're like, I'm just so average or I'm below average. Rejoice, rejoice. God is using you. God is using me, all of us. We're all average. Let's be honest. We're all average. We're here in West Sacramento today, okay? We're, we're average. We, we qualified, okay? God is using our averageness, our lowliness, to put to shame the great things of the world. God says, I'm going to take these, and I'm going to put the world to shame, the things that are. I'm going to use you to put them to shame. It's almost like an echo of James 1, 9 says, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. Church, we have Christ. We have Christ. Takeaway three, what do we trust in? What do we trust in? Chapter two, verse five says, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men. How many of us are trusting in the things of this world, the wisdom of this world? Well, if I get sick, uh, I've got a great doctor, I've got a great insurance policy, where I've got a great way, you know, all these other, you know, medicine techniques or whatever it is, right? Or, or technology or money or business or relationships, whatever it is, right? What are we trusting in? And church, how can we say how can we honestly say that I trust God with my eternal life, my eternal security, but I trust other things for this world, for this life? How can we trust God with eternity, but not trust him with today? Church, it's, it's backwards. We can use the things. We should use the things in this world. I'm not saying anything about against doctors. But our trust, our trust belongs to only one, God and his power. And the last takeaway is boldness in our evangelism. You know, it's reassuring to remember that people getting saved doesn't depend on our wisdom. Amen? Because isn't that so intimidating? Like, oh, I, don't know what I'm, I don't know what to tell them. Or, right, like, what if I tell them something and then they ask me a question and I can't answer that question? Like, isn't that going to push them away even more? The answer in the Bible is very simple. No. Because their salvation isn't going to depend on you answering all their questions. Salvation depends on the foolish and weak message of the cross and Jesus Christ. And if they get saved, and if God opens their eyes, God's going to get all the glory. You don't have to worry about their, how they respond. You're not the one saving people. I'm not the one saving people. It's God opening their eyes. Our job is just to tell them about Christ and him crucified on our behalf, and many will reject him. As we see, many will reject him, but God will do his work. great example of this is if you look at Christianity and compare it to like Mormonism, right? Mormons are super organized, right? They, they, I'm pretty sure they've got manuals for everything, right? They, they've got one central organization that's controlling everything. They've got a great system. People, you know, get out of high school, graduate. They go on a two-year missionary trip. Just imagine the impact we could have for Christ if we just did what the Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses did, right? I mean, this is just amazing, so to speak, and we, as Christians, on the other hand, we can't even agree on whether a show like The Chosen is a, ultimately a good thing or a bad thing, right? Like, we're, we're bickering here. And yet God has been working and building his church, despite our weaknesses, despite our disorganization, despite our lack of wisdom. 
He has been building his church steadily for 2,000 years. His church is the unsinkable ship that will never go down. And he doesn't do it through the wisdom of church leaders and great men, but through the transformative power of the gospel. So, as we call up the band here right now, going back to the beginning, from the start, man and Satan have been at odds with God, haven't we? We've been hoping to bite off some glory from God, to exalt ourselves over the maker, our maker, and almost all of our actions have been to make a name for ourselves, to exalt ourselves above our assigned post. But through our sin, all we do is we make it worse for us, don't we? We just dig that hole deeper and deeper and deeper. But God in his grace came down into our hole and he lifts us up and he doesn't want any help, guys. He doesn't. God has chosen a way of salvation that is specifically designed to put to shame all of our efforts in saving ourselves and reaching God on our own. That's why, church, salvation is by faith alone. Amen? It's the only thing that we can do is just trust in him, to lean upon him. And church, friend, if you haven't given your life to him yet, I encourage you repent, turn, trust in him that he will save you, that he will lead you home, that he will keep you from stumbling as the book of Jude says. Trust in him. God uses what is foolish and weak to show how great he is. And he has designed all of this so that we can be saved and he can demonstrate his greatness, his goodness, his excellence. And as Romans eleven thirty six says, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Let's stand. Let's pray right now. Let's just take a minute of time to soak in the goodness, the greatness of God, the glory of God over all of our efforts and thank him and bask in his grace. Lord Jesus, I thank you that there is nothing in me, in us, that saves us. It's so relieving. God, I thank you that your grace is completely free. Your love is infinite. And God, I just pray, continue working, God, in the lives of the people around us, in our lives, Lord. Keep using that foolish, weak message and us, average people, for your glory. God, can't wait when we will all stand there in your presence and see how all this unfolds, Lord, and how you glorify yourself and exalt yourself over all powers and dominions and rulers and authorities through Christ, through your gospel. Jesus, we thank you. And we pray this in your precious, precious name. Amen.